Let's just pray and let's commit this uh, time in the Word to the Lord and let's just uh, we're going to consider a very interesting individual in the Word of God. Father, we are thankful tonight for Jesus. We're thankful for all that He's done for us. We are thankful for His shed blood upon the cross. We thank you, Lord, as we've just sung, that uh, there is uh, safety to be had. We thank you, Lord, that there's security uh, because we're under the blood. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. And thank you, Lord, for providing such a wonderful uh, salvation through Christ. Uh, bless our time now, we pray in your word. We pray that we would be instructed. And I pray, Lord, that we would be encouraged. I pray, Lord, that uh, we might meet with you tonight and that we might be challenged in our own walk with you. So bless our time now, we pray. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I, I've been a pastor just thinking about the time frame, probably for about 24 years. And it's quite easy because I kind of just have to think as to how old Daniel is. And then I'm able to work it out from there because my first pastorate when I was still in Bible college, Daniel had just been born. And so it was a very busy time of life. But so for 24 years, I've, I've been a pastor. And uh, over the years, I've seen... People get on fire for God, do things for God, be encouraged, be full of zeal. And then after a while, I see that flame kind of just fizzle out. And the person that at one time was faithful and in the house of God for every service soon began to uh, become less and less faithful. Sometimes they were the, the very best of workers. Sometimes whenever there was a work that needed to be performed, uh, you know that they would be there and their shoulder was to the wheel. But then, sadly, after a period of time, they would be nowhere to be found. Sadly, uh, there's been many that who have at one time been a faithful servant of God uh, to have just lost their way. And uh, people have tried to reach them, encourage them, pray with them, pray for them. Uh, but yet, sadly, they remain in a backslidden state. It is J.C. Ryle who said this. He said that it's a miserable thing to be a backslider. He said, of all the unhappy things that can befall a man, I suppose backsliding is the worst. A stranded ship, a broken-winged eagle, a garden overrun with weeds, a harp without strings. A church in ruins are all sad sights, but a backslider is a sadder sight still. And it has once well been said that perhaps the most miserable person is a person who is a backslider in heart. It is a sad thing that a person that at one time was living for the Lord would now be out of service. And tonight as we continue our theme of looking at different characters in the Word of God, we're going to look at an individual that very, very clearly seems to you and I to be a backslider. And he, as Jonathan said earlier, is a man by the name of Demas. And if you've paid attention over the past few weeks, I've kind of alluded to him in one way or another, particularly when we looked at Lot and Lot's wife. Uh, I've alluded to this man by the name of Demas. He is an individual that, to be honest, we don't really know a great deal about him. We are, there are only three verses in the Bible that mention him by name. But in each of those three verses, there is something recorded, something written, that is quite instructive uh, about this man by the name of Demas. He was a man that very clearly at one time loved the Lord, served the Lord, was a faithful worker of the Lord, and then... At the end of it all, he just came off the rails, we would say, and became a terrible backslider, one that loved the world. It's interesting to notice that the man Demas, the name Demas, the name literally means governor of my people. So it's quite a good name to have, quite a lofty name to have. But sadly, it is given to a man that at the end couldn't even govern his own life. And there are a great few lessons that we can learn from Demas tonight. Uh, 
lessons that I think are telling for each and every one of us because none of us should think to ourselves tonight that what happened to him can never happen to me. In fact, these are lessons that are quite pertinent to each and every one of us. And I'm thankful, and I'm sure you are as well, that as you read through the Bible, that you don't find that God covers the sins of his saints. He doesn't hide it. He doesn't say, well, I don't want to put David in a bad light. Don't let me tell you about the way that Peter would deny the Lord. You know, Jesus, God would reveal the, the, the sins of his saints so that you and I could learn from it. Whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. So we need to take to heart the things that we read, the good things, the positive examples, and the negative ones. We, there's a great lesson to be learned wherever we go uh, in the Word of God. And we need these lessons. Because if we're honest with ourselves, just like that hymn where the hymn says, um, prone to wonder, uh, what was it called again? Come thou fount. The, the hymn, Come thou fount. And it speaks about our wondering heart. And I wonder if it isn't because, because to me it's a favorite. I, I quite enjoy the song, and I, I guess to many here. But we identify with it, don't, it, don't we? Because we're able to recognize that in our own hearts, we have hearts that are prone to wonder. And that's why in the song, and of course in our prayer, we, we do pray and say, uh, Lord, my heart is prone to wonder, but take my heart, Lord. Take and seal it. If we're going to be kept strong, and if we're going to be faithful, let me tell you, it's not going to be by your tenacity. It's not going to be as you say, well, I'm going to dig deeper in my Christian life. It's going to be by the grace of God. You're saved by the grace of God, and you're kept by the grace of God. So we need to be looking to God. And the lessons that we learn about Demas are lessons that we really need to take on board. And there's a great lesson to just help us in our walk with God, to keep us from uh, wondering as uh, this one hymn talks of, and of course, as to what happened with Demas. So there are a few principles we can say that we can glean from the life of Demas. So there are three things I'll share with you. The first thing is quite simply this, is that a good start doesn't guarantee a good finish. A good start doesn't guarantee a good finish finish. We read of him in the book of Philemon, in verse 24. And what we read of Demas here is quite encouraging for us. We would think to ourselves here as a great Christian. It simply says this, Paul is rehearsing, he's reminding us of certain people that had served faithfully alongside. And so he says in verse 24, Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas. They notice those words, my fellow laborers. So the first time we come across Demas, we, we think to ourselves, well, here is somebody that has this wonderful title, a wonderful descriptive title, title where Paul says he is a fellow laborer. And let me tell you something, in the church of God, uh, in the early church, in Paul's day, do you know how much of a, a lofty title that must have been? Where Paul would introduce you and say, listen, this is my fellow laborer. People would think, here is a Christian of note. Here is someone that's faithful. And Demas was that man. He was somebody that was a fellow laborer alongside the Apostle Paul. And so when you think about this word, fellow laborer, you automatically, automatically think of somebody that is a devoted Christian. He's on fire for God. He's serving faithfully. He's serving alongside that great apostle Paul. And you could say, well, his devotion is easily seen. You can see it in his walk, in the way that he lives, and you can see it in his work, in the thing that he does. He is a fellow servant alongside these others. Now, the other people that are mentioned in this short list for us are known to us. They were certainly known to the early church. Mark, he wrote a gospel. And, of course, Luke, he would write the gospel that bears his name. And he would also write the book of Acts. Aristarchus, he was someone that would go on to serve time with the Apostle Paul in prison. So, in the early church, these were people 
that were of note. These were people that were well known in the early church. And so we read this verse and we would have to say at the outset, he was somebody that began very well. He was someone that was well known, well respected, and of course well liked. He had a great position, he served God faithfully, and he was a good example. But as close as Demas was to the Lord, and as faithfully as he served the Lord alongside the Apostle Paul, although he began well, it didn't guarantee a, a good ending for him. In fact, he ended very badly. Because we read in 2 Timothy, in chapter 4, and verse 10, that, uh, and this is now at the end of Paul's life and ministry, and it's a sad verse that he has to say for us, he says, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica. So that's quite a sad verse. He began very well, didn't he? A fellow laborer. At the end of Paul's life and ministry, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present evil world. Now we don't have any record as to how Demas came to faith in Christ. And I think we just make a, an assumption based upon his beginning with Paul that he was a servant, that he was indeed saved. But something happened in his life where he began to fizzle out as a servant of God. He had began well, he had run well, but something happened whereby he would get his eye off the Lord, his eye off the goal, and started to look to the things of this world. So the first principle and lesson that we learn from Demas is that to start well isn't going to be quite as important as finishing well. You know, if you, run, if you see someone run a race and you see someone begin well, they're quick off the starting blocks. You think, oh, fantastic. But if that person stumbles and falls in the race, well, then you don't think such a good thing about it, do you? But the person may well even be a slow starter. But there he is faithfully running and there he, he finishes the race and he even has a, a good position in the race. That's the kind of person that we want to be. The fact of the matter is, you and I cannot change how we began. Because I think in our beginning with the Lord, our walk with the Lord, our salvation, of course, was unique to each and every one of us. But, you know, some of us grew at different in, in different ways and at different speeds, if you like. Some kind of remained a babe for a while and others kind of quickly grasped and quickly served. But you can't go back in time, can you? You can't say, well, I wish I could just start again a fresh page and I'll run quickly to start with. No, none of us can do that. Where you are tonight is where you are. But you can determine that you're going to finish well. It doesn't matter how you started, and it, didn't, it doesn't matter what happened yesterday. It doesn't matter as to how much time you may have even wasted in your service for what you could have done for God. You can't change that. But from this moment on, you can say, but I'm going to finish well. I'm going to, I'm going to do my best to serve God as He wants me to serve Him. So the first thing that we learn about Demas is that he was an individual that while he started well, he didn't finish well. So a good start doesn't guarantee a good finish. I think we can learn, just before we go to our, the second great lesson we can learn from Demas, there are a few things that we, we need to take from this. So the first thing that I think is important is to make sure, to be 100% sure that you are saved. Because... To be honest, I don't know this about Demas. I assume that he's saved. But the most important thing in anyone's life is, am I saved? If I was to die tonight, if I was to breathe my last breath, if I was to be ushered into the presence of God, would I be saved? That's the most important thing. The very most important thing. You know, the Bible tells us very clearly that this is something that we need to be sure of because as the tree falls 
That's how it's going to lie. And when you die, if you die in your sin, Jesus said, where I go, you cannot come. So it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter what your age you may be, you might be a teenager, you might be an older person, be sure of this fact. Am I saved? Do I know God as my saviour? That's the most important thing. In fact, that is the most important question that you'll ever have to answer. You're not going to be able to, you're not going to meet Jesus by joining a church. You're not going to meet Jesus by becoming baptized. You won't meet Jesus. You won't be saved by saying, I'm going to read the Bible more. I'm going to pray more. And you can have a list of things. The only way to meet Jesus and to be sure of this matter of salvation is come to him as a sinner and say, God, would you please forgive me? Because I have sinned and I'm trusting in you and I'm believing on you to save my soul. Would you do that? That's the very most important thing that we could ever do. We need to be sure of our salvation. But then another thing that we, we need to be sure about, and incidentally, that's where your race begins, at salvation. If you're not saved, you're not in the race. You haven't begun yet. You can't say, I'm going to end well. You haven't begun yet. So may you begin if you don't know Christ the Savior. Maybe tonight you say, I need to begin this race. I need to get off this road that leads to destruction and I need to get onto that narrow way that leads to life eternal. Then the second thing that we need to be mindful of is that the Christian life, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. You know, there are some races that are over, they start and finish very quickly, like a, a hundred meter dash. You know, you, it's over before you can, you know, 10 seconds or so. Well, for some, that might be like 25 seconds for me. But you know, it's over quite quickly. But the Christian race isn't a dash. It's a marathon. And in fact, your race is going to last as long as your life. So it's not just a matter of just getting up and running. Well, you've got to walk. And you, you know, you've got to be able to, you know, there are things going to happen and develop in your Christian life. But you've got to recognize that it's a marathon and not a race. And that's why Hebrews tells us that we need to be looking to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. But we need to have an eye upon him. We're encompassed about with this great cloud of witnesses, but we need to be just passing on and following faithfully and looking to Jesus. It's a marathon. It'll last your whole life. And then another thing to recognize with this aspect where uh, Demas began well but ended badly is that we need to take the time to encourage others in their race. Because as Christians, we should never be selfish. We should never think of it like this and say, well, I've got a race to run. I've got a goal to lay hold of. It doesn't matter about you. Now, there's an aspect of our Christian life where we're not to be looking at one another. Sometimes people look at one another to criticize. But I think we should have our eye out for one another. Because if you see your brother or your sister stumble and fall, you should be willing to kind of get them by the arm and help them up in their Christian life. We need to be a, a help to one another. And, and round about us, each one of us, we're running this race together, and we know that there are some people that are struggling. Sometimes church attendance kind of just drops off, and you think, well, where is that person? That person should be in church. And of course, we all may think like that, but let me tell you this. And oftentimes when I speak to somebody, they'll say, well, I'll be in church on Sunday. That's not what it's about. And of course, I want people to be in church all of the time. But I know this, is that when a person's church attendance drops off, long before that ever happened, long, months before that ever happened, they've stopped reading their Bible. Long before that's ever happened, they've stopped praying. The public worship is the last thing to go. But personal worship is the first thing to go. And so when we are around about us and we see somebody struggling, listen, we need to have a heart for them. And we need to come alongside them and, and encourage them. Not scold them, I expect to see you in church on Sunday. We need to rather put an arm around them and say, how can I help you? Can I encourage you in some way? And that's what we should seek to do one with another. Because there are people around about us who are struggling in this race. The Bible tells us, I know ultimately we all have to bear our own burden, but the Bible also encourages us to bear one another's burdens. 
and so fulfill the law of Christ. So yes, we're running a race. And we've got to start well, we've got to finish well, more importantly, but what about those around about us as well? If they fall, if they stumble, we need to try and help them. And then another thing to, that makes us think about this is that in the same way, the same way that our brother could stumble and fall, you could stumble and fall as well. And I could stumble and fall. None of us are immune. There's not one of us here tonight that can say, I will not fall. I will not stumble. We can have all the determination in the world. But if we get our eyes off the Lord, there's no telling how we'll end up. The Bible says, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. You and I, we're kept by the grace of God and we need to recognize that we need to look and lean on and cling to the Lord because if it wasn't for him, we would stumble and fall too. We could be just like Demas. We could begin well. We might be doing well today, but you don't know about tomorrow. So we need to take a lesson from that. So the first thing that we learn about Demas tonight is simply this, that a good start doesn't guarantee a good finish. Right, the second thing that I like you to notice about Demas is that coldness of the heart is slow, but it's deadly. Now you might think to yourself, well, how does coldness come into this? How can we associate coldness to someone like Demas? We know that he didn't end well and it seemed like he finished. Uh, that he began well, but he, he said, we know that he didn't end very well. But how can we associate coldness to him? Well, look if you would in Colossians in chapter 4 and verse 14. Paul, as he concludes this, uh, this epistle to the church at Colossae, he includes Demas in his salutation, and he says this, he says, Luke, the beloved physician, and then notice Demas, Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas, salute you, or greet you. The first time we meet Demas, he's been commended, my fellow laborer. <coughs> He's a servant. He's somebody that's walking along, working along. Here we read of Demas, where Paul just mentions his name, Demas. Now, of course, we, we can't read too much into this other than the fact that there is no word of commendation given to Demas at this point. And the indication that we have from this is that there is something perhaps beginning to happen in the life of Demas. Maybe Paul can't quite put his finger on it. But there is no word, there's no glowing words of commendation about Demas. Not like Luke, my beloved physician. There's nothing like that for Demas here. I, I, I suspect that Paul, as he thought about Demas in this part of his life, he thought something's not quite right here. At one time he was so full of zeal. Always talking about Jesus. Always seeking to serve. There's something quite not right here. It seems like the fire is kind of going out. Oh, Paul would say, you know, Demas has reported for duty. He's there. But it's almost like he doesn't want to be there. There's a coldness that is creeping into his life. And of course, this change of heart, this coolness or coldness of heart is going to ultimately, ultimately result in him walking away from the things of God. And so it could well be that Paul began to see some signs of cooling off. And I want you to take note of this. This matter of coldness of heart is something that is a slow process. It begins very slowly. Sometimes we can't even perceive it. But it is such a deadly thing when things begin to cool off. No, perhaps with Demas, he began to give himself a little bit of leeway in his Christian life. Can you identify that? 
where you think to yourself, well, I've served the Lord faithfully and, you know, I'm going to all the services and I'm, you know, we can't tick off all the things that we're faithful at doing and we can say, but I'll just give myself a little bit of room here because after all, look at my track record. Whatever happened with Demas, he began to cool off. And instead of being under the control of God's Holy Spirit, he began slowly but surely to be under the controls of his own personal passions. It was no longer what God wanted me to do, but rather the things that what he wanted to do. And he began to cool off. And the Bible says that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. You know, leaven in the Bible is never used in a good way. Or yeast. A little bit of yeast can just be used to kind of puff up a whole loaf. And a little bit of sin. Leaven is always used as sin in the Bible. A little bit of sin in your life. Just a small little thing. You don't know how it's going to develop and how it will overtake things in your life. And that's very likely what happened with Demas. And it all began with the heart. And we need to be careful. We need to guard our hearts. And he had began to cool off towards the things of God. You know, Jesus said to the church at Ephesus and in those uh, Messages that there's seven churches in Revelation 2 and chapter 3 and, and chapter 3 to the church of Ephesus. That's what he said about the church. And of course, this church had begun very well. But he said in verse 4 and 5, he said, Nevertheless, excuse me, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. And he says in verse 5, Remember therefore, remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first work. And it's not an uncommon thing for a believer to leave their first love. They kind of fall out of love with the Lord. And something else takes the place. Somebody spoke about temptation like this. And I've copied their outline for it. They said that temptation can be used with this acronym BAD. B-A-D. Temptation can be used like this. B. Or the first aspect of the word BAD. B is that they begin to believe the deception of the flesh. They said, in our spiritual world, something has happened. Deception and belief are joined together and sin is conceived. The belief structure, if you like, is affected. And then the letter A, we act out the sin. It moves from contemplation to implementation. We begin to do the things that we, you know, are thinking aren't so bad. And then it ends with D. It ends with death, which is a consequence of our sin. But he says it's not the physical death, but rather it's a death to a tender conscience. It is the death to a sensitiveness to the Holy Spirit. And it's a death to our usefulness in our service in the kingdom of God. We need to be careful of temptation in this way because temptation, of course, the sin isn't being tempted as rather as we act upon it. We believe it, we begin to act upon it, and then we find that death follows. So we need to keep our relationship with the Lord in a good standing. We need to guard our hearts. We need to be careful of a coolness. We need to be careful about cooling off towards the things of God. So a good start doesn't guarantee a good finish. And coldness of heart is gradual, but it's always deadly. And then lastly, this evening, your direction will determine your destination. And I say this because with, and we had, we had spoken about this with, um, with Lot, because he was somebody that had focused his attention upon Sodom. Remember as to how he left Abraham? And how he uh, pitched his tent towards Sodom. And then it wasn't going to be long before he was living in Sodom. Sitting at the gate. One of the rulers of the place of Sodom. Our direction is going to determine our destination. So I take you again to that verse in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 10. Where the Bible says that Demas hath forsaken me having loved this present world. So it, what's true in our physical realm is going to be true in the spiritual realm. Tomorrow, Lord willing, Tracy and I are going to head north. We're going to go up to the lakes for a few days. 
So that's our direction we're going, and that's where we get end up, hopefully, if, we, if I follow Tracy's directions. That's what we say. The direction I take will determine my destination. If it's true of the physical realm, how much truer is it in the spiritual realm? That the direction that we take is going to lead us to our destination. Paul found himself serving along somebody, along the side of somebody, that had become, began to become colder towards the things of God, who began looking away from the things of God and looking towards the things of this world. Our direction will determine our destination. And at the very end, Paul would have to declare bluntly and plainly, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. And this word forsaken is quite a strong word. It talks about being deserted. He had been deserted by, the, uh, by somebody that at one time been so faithful. You know, when, when Demas forsook Paul, when he abandoned Paul, it wasn't so much that he was abandoning Paul. It was that he was abandoning his Savior. His walk with God was affected and his work for God, of course, came to a standstill. And if we would think about this determination of his, and his direction to look to the world, it began in a very subtle way. I don't think for a minute that Demas woke, woke up one day and said, you know what? I'm going to backslide. I don't think he thought to himself, well, today I'm turning from the things of God and I'm turning to the world. I don't think that happened like that. I think it was just an incremental thing. Over days and weeks and months, he began to slowly but surely change direction. He didn't wake up one morning and say, I want to be a miserable Christian. He woke up one morning and found himself in a, that place but if he was to retrace his steps, he could say, well, I, I certainly did begin to drift. And I did begin to lose my focus, and I did begin, and now here I am, I'm in the world. The direction we take is going to determine our destination. The fact of the matter is, is nobody can serve two masters. And this world is so subtle, we live in the world. Every day of our life, we have to deal with things. Things that are a, a continual bombardment against us. There's a temptation on every side. We have to guard ourselves against these things so carefully, lest we begin to, like Demas, develop a love for the world. We're in the world, but we're not to be of the world. Demas found that his destination was determined by the direction that he took. He ended up in the world because he began looking towards the world. And that's why we read earlier in our Bible reading that the Bible tells us very clearly, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You know, if things began to wane in our Christian life, you find yourself getting a little bit cooler towards the things of God. You don't really want to worship no more. You don't want to spend time with God in prayer or in his word. And there's a coldness creeping in. And instead of looking to as to how you can serve God, you find that you're looking away to what the world has to offer and how the world does. Let me tell you, you need to arrest yourself. You need to stop yourself because the direction you take is going to determine your destination. He ended up in the world. Think about the prodigal son and where he ended up. He, for a long time, was faithfully serving with his brother in, the, in his father's farm. But when they divided the father's inheritance, he went to the world. And he began to live like the world lives. But evidently, for a long time, his heart was there in the world. I want to get away and I want to live in the world. And that's where he ended up. And he said, when you read the story of the prodigal son, he ended up in a place where he would never have thought he would have ever have been. So we need to learn tonight, like Demas, that the destination is going to be determined by the direction that we take. This is what happened to Demas. He was a man who began so well. He, he's a man that has a tremendous name, governor of my people, and he couldn't even govern himself. He was a man that began well, but sadly he didn't end well. 
He was a man that was on fire for God at one time, but the flames were slowly being put out and there was a coldness that was creeping in. He was a man that was going in the way of God's way, but sadly, he was looking to the world and it wasn't long before he was in the world. So may we learn a great lesson from someone like Demas. We, there's no record in the Bible that he ever did repent, that he ever did get right with God, that he ever did kind of arrest himself and say, well, this is a terrible state for me to be in. I need to get back to the place of blessing. We don't read about that anyway. I hope that he did, but we don't know that he did. But you and I tonight, we need to kind of, you know, check our own spiritual well-being. You know where you are with the Lord. You know what is, how you're spending time with God or not spending time with Him. So to begin well doesn't mean, it doesn't guarantee a good finish. Coldness of heart is slow, but it's deadly. And your destination is going to be determined by your direction. May the Lord encourage us tonight that we would look to the Lord and trust in Him and uh, be leaning upon Him. We began this Christian life by faith. It's not going to be made perfect by the flesh. We're going to be perfected by Him. And so we continue to look to Him. So may the Lord encourage us to keep our eyes upon our Lord and our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Let us pray. We are thankful, Father, for 